Welcome to Food for Freedom. My name is Christopher Miller, Senior Director of Education and Community Engagement here at the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center in Cincinnati, Ohio. Just wanna welcome everyone for joining us for this meaningful conversation. Uh, as the pandemic has revealed a widespread disparity of access to not only quality healthcare, but credible access to quality food, negatively impacts outcomes for black communities. The root of these issues run deep and back centuries beginning with slavery and later a lack of opportunities based on racial discrimination. There's been a growing movement for food justice to address the matters of food apartheid. Food apartheid is more than the lack of grocery stores or other health food options uh, in non-white or low income economic communities. Food apartheid also points to the discrimination of communities of color when it comes to economic opportunities. The T. Colin Campbell Center for Nutrition Studies notes that the solutions must address economic disparities. Putting grocery stores in these communities cannot be the only solution. It must start with equity across the board, job creation, education, and other opportunities in areas that have traditionally been ignored. Many activists and modern day conductors are engaged in meaningful deeds towards food justice, which is an essential part of social justice. So we have this conversation tonight, followed by a culinary historian, uh, Mr. Andre Taylor. And so joining us in moderating this meaningful discussion is my colleague, Asia Harris, who is our youth programs manager, but also engaged in many of our public programming. And so to usher, usher, usher us into the conversation, we have Asia Harris, if you don't mind joining us. Hello, thank you, Chris. This experience is directly aligned with the 2022 Black History theme, Black Health and Wellness. And we have an outstanding panel today, so I will allow them to introduce themselves. Good evening, everyone. My name is Mona Jenkins. I am a community organizer here in Cincinnati, Ohio, and also the co-founder of Queen Mother's Market Cooperative. Good evening, I'm Michaela Oldfield. I am director of the Greater Cincinnati Regional Food Policy Council. We're a cross-sector coalition working to create a healthy, equitable, sustainable food system for our region. Hi, good evening, everybody. My name is Maha Selassie. I'm the um, co-founder and board president for Gym City Market, a, a, a food co-op in Dayton, Ohio, and then co-executive director for Co-op Dayton, which is at the co-op incubator where we're, we're building a co-op economy in Dayton. Thank you everyone for those introductions. So you all mentioned a few terms that I want to kind of define before we get started. So um, if you all could tell us what is a food desert and what is a co-op? I can start by explaining a, a food desert. Um, technically the term is, the qualification is when a neighborhood or a specific area is without easy access to healthy foods. Um, usually it's defined by within or beyond a one mile radius uh, of a neighborhood. Is there a grocery store? Usually it's the way it's affiliated, but you can have healthy foods through gardenings and other opportunities. If, 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 I, if I could add, look, were you going to ask food apartheid next or I was going to? No, please do whatever you would okay. like to share. So, um, so like, uh, so food part, food deserts are, it's a, it's a common term. Um, but like when we say desert, sometimes it implies a natural phenomenon, you know, and, uh, and, and it gets spread to say, you know, we have book deserts and we have healthcare deserts, right? And all these things. And so um, I like to use the language food apartheid with uh, Chris Bond in the beginning, because to me that, that acknowledges there's a structural mechanism, right? So like, like not only is there lack of food, but there's been intentional underdevelopment that's been built inside of the structure, you know, oftentimes through redlining. And so when we say food apartheid, we acknowledge the human uh, capacity within it, which to me gives us hope, 
Because if we know that it was man-made, then we can unmake it, we can reimagine it, right? And that gives us hope. The more that we realize we have the power to transform our lived environment, it gives us more hope that we can put our gifts to the center of the circle. Thank you. Totally Thank agree. You. It's, 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 and I, I use that term food apartheid as well. It's acknowledging that intentionality through the redlining, the racism, the social and economic um, disinvestment. It's, it's like you said, man-made and, and can be undone. Thank you. So to speaking of, you know, man-made and things that need to be undone. So Michaela, you're with us as well. How can everyday citizens be aware of policy and who can they reach out to about food apartheid, food desert, lack of access? Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that citizens can be involved. I, I'm going to do a shameless plug. The Food Policy Council is one such avenue. However, we are not the only entity doing sort of food systems, food access work in our region. There are collab a number of different collaboratives where people are trying to tackle these issues of food access. And so Amaha talked about he's part of this co-op Dayton group. There is a uh, sister organization in Cincinnati called Co-op Cincy, which is incubating things like Queen Mother's Market. I might have some visitors drop in during this, so apologies. Um, okay, can you head back up and to Daddy, please? Do you know where my blue candy is? No, go to Daddy, please. Hold on, can I play down here? No, go to daddy. Ah. Looking for access. Thank you, thank you everyone. <laughs> um, but so Co-op Cincy and Co-op Dayton are both these organizations that are looking at how do you create a sort of different economy and a different type of trans um, interactions between customers and the sort of businesses that supply customers needs by having worker and community owned or companies that are truly actually meeting communities needs. And instead of extracting wealth, the way much of our current sort of economy works, they're reinvesting wealth back into the workers and the people who benefit from the economy. And so there's, those, those are great ways to sort of get economically involved. And then on the policy side, um, there's policy that's affecting the food systems at every single level from city zoning code, building code, economic development policy, tax brackets or tax benefits to state and federal. Um, and I probably shouldn't spend too much time just ran, rattling off organizations, but there's a lot of ways to get involved with organizations or you can call your city council people. It's actually like they're the most they're the most accessible elected officials probably in anybody's world. You should call them. Thank you, thank you for that information. I think that we we can't have too many resources. So you know, speaking of you know markets and things like that, uh, Mona, could you tell us a little bit about the pop up um, that you've created and did that help you lead you to Queen Mother's Market? Sure, actually, it was Queen Mother's Market that came about first. Um, about five years ago, um, the neighborhood I was living in, Walnut Hills, lost our only grocery store. And as a result, uh, me being a community organizer, I started hosting um, community engagement sessions and asking residents, okay, now that we've lost our grocery store, what do we want to do? And I heard them and, you know, the first thing was folks were like, well, let's just get another one. Um, okay, I, I hear what you're saying. And regardless of what I believe, it was what they wanted. So um, started asking other grocery stores if they wanted to come in, um, they did not. And so went back and held additional sessions and said, okay, here's where we're at. But here are some of our options. Have you ever heard of community supported agriculture? Have you ever heard of cooperatives? And through having those conversations, that's when the community said, hey, let's go for a cooperative. And so um, we started looking into that. And then all of a sudden, uh, the pandemic hit, which kind of put us back on our heels, still working kind of in the background. Um, but it emphasized a different need, the, the emergency more so of, you know, we were already in a food insecure neighborhood. Now with this, pandemic. Now we're seeing the flaws within the current system, food system. Um, and we had to make adjustments for that. 
And so we started doing ride shares. We started doing emergency things that just to get food into the neighborhood. And that's when um, we decided to do what's called a buyer's club. And so when it's a group of folks who um, decide to buy in bulk in order to save, um, work in, in a collective manner, um, because again, food became scarce, prices were rising, um, but yet our income was not rising. So we still had to meet those needs and make adjustments because we were also losing housing at the time. We were lacking education. Um, and so um, we basically adjusted towards the needs of the community and offered this buyer's club um, and, and start purchasing in bulk. And so we'll continue to use that um, until we um, reach the brick and mortar store of Queen Mother's Market. Thank you. So Amaha, you also have your co-op up in Dayton, which is, you know, covering a different region of our of our local um you know area here so what does your organization do and offer yeah sure so gym city market is uh, a full service grocery store um where we have like a two-tier pricing system and then we also have a, a community kitchen with uh, six stove tops um a health clinic and and a uh, community room so that we can create like a third space where people can come and meet um, and gather. But I, I think like uh, Mona Michaela both touched on some real key pieces, right? Was one is that like like uh, so our, our area was underdeveloped. We had forty thousand residents, no full service grocery store, you know. And I'll be honest, like I hadn't put much thought into like there is a such thing as a food system, right? And that like, like who's controlling it and who's making the decisions about it, right? And then uh, the more we started looking, you know, at the time we were second in nation for food insecurity and realized like, this is not acceptable. Like, like, like sometimes in areas that's been underdeveloped, you know I mean? We, we have, we're three times less likely to have a grocery store, three times more likely to have over excessive abundance in, uh, you know, fast food and this, that and other, but we accept that as being, that's okay. You know what I mean? Where we can go to other parts of the community and we'll have, you know, two or three grocery stores within a one mile radius, right? And so uh, within the African-American community in particular, you know, it, it's really a, a thing of like how, how we have liberation, right? Like, I, like I, I love this theme, you know, food for freedom, right? Like, 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 like the more we can control what we're eating, you know what I mean? That's like the key towards uh, freedom and liberation, right? And so um, we gathered together the community residents, we did a survey, and uh, the community said that they wanted a grocery store. So then we kind of, we went underground for about a year and a half. You know, we started connecting with Co-op Sensi, you know what I mean, who was ahead of us in, in this type of thinking. And, uh, you know, we, we emerged uh, the Gym City Market over, over about a three, three, four year period. Thank you. And you mentioned things in your um, organization like community kitchens, what resources are available? And, um, you know, how do they make a difference that these things are offered to the public? Sure. You know, like, so even today we had a, a high school come in uh, called uh, DECA. They came in and did, uh, we did, uh, we did some trainings in the community kitchen. They did a cooking demonstration and learned how to make samosas. And, and, you know, we talked about food history and things like that. And so uh, it's been a way for us to, um, to connect the community with different recipes, different cultures and types of food that can be created. And, and we, we stress, we don't food shame. So like sometimes co-ops, you know, so co-ops are something that's community owned and worker owned and or in our case at least. And um, sometimes, you know, they're seen as just like organic and this, that and other, you know, but we try to have a mix because we want to meet everybody where they're at and give them the access to different opportunities and different types of food. And then they can choose what they want. So if they want to choose things that might not be the, the most healthiest, you know what I mean? That's fine. As long as you have other options available. And then we try to educate uh, the community to show like, oh, this is good for diabetes. This is good for heart cholesterol and things like that. So the education piece. And then uh, our health clinic, you know, they can get uh, basic treatments. Um, you know, recently we started adding, uh, you know, vaccinations there. And then the community room, you know, we understand that a key part of health is connectivity, right? Because it's, it's a social determinant of the health, right? And so we, uh, we emphasize how to build deep connections in the community. So people rent out from everything from yoga to, you know, um, you know, different clubs and uh, community organizations that need a meeting space um, that we can, you know, build this sense of, you know, 
like I think some of the audience are gonna get it. Some won't. We like we, we like to call it like like cheers. You know what I mean? Everybody knows their name. And when Norm walks in, everybody yells Norm. And when I tell to some people, they get it. Other people, they're like Bueller, Bueller. Like, like what's going on? But uh, but yeah. So we want to create that first space. You know where where uh, you know we can build that real strong sense of of community and how co-ops can be an invitation towards that as we're building a, a, a more beloved community. Can I jump in with, I just want to say something about like, to me, one of the things that's so exciting about what both co-op Dayton and the Gem City Market and what Mona are doing is um, it's, it's food as a pathway to community organizing and it's community organizing around food. So like for me, one of the reasons I love working in the food system as a point of social change is because it's trite, but everybody eats, right? And so it's an opportunity to find common ground, do some of that work on like all these big picture, big systems issues that are really, really a problem in our society, but we can start to chip away at them through like the food opens, you know, it's the pathway to people's hearts, right? And so you can start to tackle that. And so both, both these organizations are talking about community organizing where they're really being responsive to their community and designing what the community needs instead of just like designing what's going to maximize profits out of the communities. Thank you. So when food, we speak, go ahead, I just want to say food is a way that we can connect with each other across um, cultures, regardless of language, we all need to eat, right? And it's a way for us to not only connect with one another, it's healing. So when we celebrate, when you, we um, lose someone, we provide food. When we, you know, are celebrating graduations or new births, we provide food. Food is a pathway of that connectivity. And so we just want to offer that space for folks to gather and heal with other um, folks with, around them. And if I could jump in real quick, I saw Asia. Uh, uh, you know, it's interesting, right? That uh, I like to see food as a canary in a coal mine too. And what I mean by that is that, like, like if you have an area that's been underdeveloped and has food insecurity, that it, it, it's not a single issue, right? So, like, you're going to have low housing quality. You're going to have. Uh, probably low education, access to education and healthcare. And so like when I say a canary in a coal mine, they used to put a canary in the coal mine literally. And when the canary would die or start to die, that was the sign for the coal mine is like, oh, we, we need to get out. The air quality is not good, right? So when we send the, the lack of food security, then like that's just a symptom of these larger root issues that are taking place, right? And as Mikel said, like, 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 like food is one of the easiest ways to organize the community because as everybody said, we all got to eat. You know what I mean? I, I might not be able to cook much, but I love to eat. So it's like, uh, so it's a way to kind of get those conversations going. Um, and then while we're in the process, looking at all the other structural inequalities that are, that are working as like a web to concentrate advantage and disadvantage, right, in, in our communities. Thank yeah. you. And that, that leads right into, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, that's a great point of the sort of flip side is that like, Food is such a great pathway into dealing with social issues because so many of our social issues are what is creating the food system and its outcomes that we have. So I'm just repeating what Amaha said. That's okay. This next question might be just for you. So how um, how would generational wealth in communities change if we saw more equity in agriculture from a perspective of land, livestock, having knowledge of gardening, et cetera? <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, so this is a slightly hard question, right? But so like we just have generations and generations of privilege going to particular ki kinds of farming and particular kinds of farmers and land ownership and so much of wealth is rooted in land ownership right whether you own a, owned a house in the 20s or 30s or were able to be part of the veterans administration benefits for veterans or if you were a farmer who could only get access to lending through the fsa or the farm service agency and that was controlled by a bunch of white farmers. And so you couldn't get farmland. So like now we have a system where there's, there's a lot of organizations that are trying to buy from black farmers. They want to support BIPOC farmers. And I know Mona, Amaha, I don't know about you, but I know Mona's looking like, how do we source more culturally appropriate food for Queen Mother's Market and make sure that we're getting what we want and what we need 
And the farmers, like, they don't have land. They don't exist. And you don't have access to the lending or the capital to get the land anymore. And honestly, like, a lot of farmers are, like, losing their land because they don't have access to the capital to maintain affordability of it. And so we, we really, truly have an entire food system that is based on extraction and profit. And that means that, like, the land is seen as, like, how do we maximize profit off, off the land? And how do we maximize profit off of the people? And how do we maximize what we our production out of the land? And, and so that's, it's impoverishing for everyone. Um, and that's, I don't know, what would it look like differently? I mean, like we would have an equitable society, right? Like if we had equitable distribution of land and things that were distributed based on like need and merit instead of like whatever the standards are of how we currently distribute resources in our society I should stop but that's okay that's okay we have plenty more questions so when when we don't have this access how is the economy in general impacting food access and how can we combat it it's kind of similar but a little different um so I'll take it first and then I think probably you guys should go to um I mean I think the sort of people aren't paid enough so um you know, we've got, we've just got incredible inequities in pay around CEOs and the C-suite and what, and shareholders who are passively earning income off businesses, while the workers who do the work are not getting the food price they need to afford to eat or to pay rent on their houses. And then they have absentee landlords who are earning passive income while they can't afford to like pay rent. And, and then we have all of these systems where, um, I just lost my train of thought, I apologize. Um, where is, we're talking about- um, Yeah, so we, of- so we have like, um, so there's like all these passive income earners who are extracting all this wealth off of the workers and the sort of people who don't have the resources they need. And then it's all further subsidized by all these government policies where, you can get SNAP. And if you're a worker at one of the national grocery stores or pretty much any any major national business, right? You're probably not making enough money to pay your rent and buy your groceries. And so you're getting government assistance. And so your employer is indirectly being subsidized to underpay you so that you can afford to live and keep working for them. And so we like, there's all these, and and then you turn around and spend those government subsidies at your employer if you work at a food manufacturer or a food retailer. And so there's all these systems that are set up to sort of just keep it, keep that inequity flowing and the wealth flowing back up to the top. So I don't know, Mona or Maha, one of you guys should add. Yeah, no, I I, I really uh, appreciate that, especially what you said just now about the the subsidizing of of the the workers, right? Because that's like that that's kind of like this this how how do you create a permanent underclass, right? That that uh, that keeps resources uh, pulled pulled away, you know. And uh, I think like so for me, when I'm looking at cooperative economic development, uh, there's like a social and an economic part to it right because like it's really like an, an, an invitation into community and so you know economically it's right like like how are we uh, uh developing the means of production and for us and by us right and so it's, it's democratic you know like 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 you know one person one vote and and uh we're building you know, like we, we we identify what are the needs we have in our in our community and then we're developing co-ops for that, so like for example, we have a doula co-op right now. We have a makerspace that opened up this week. Uh, we have another little grocery store we're opening up, right? We're Mama Mope is in here. We're working on how to do uh, how to create some more uh, agriculture opportunities, right? And so it's like, like like we identify the needs in the community, and then like how do we how do we build the businesses and the infrastructure that we can flip the dollar, kind of like in Tulsa, right? To build like a solidarity economy that like we're pooling the resources, like in Dayton dollars leave Dayton quickly, right? So like, how do we pull it that it stays in the area more as we're identifying our needs and building the economy based upon our needs that, that we can start 
rising it up. But then also co-ops are like a social system, right? Because like, it's a, it's a new way of understanding. And to me, it boils down to this notion of interdependence, right? Like, 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 are we actually independent or interdependent, right? And I think that's a key question because if we're interdependent, that means that uh, we have a shared future, right? That like, uh, that my future is tied to your future or like, you know, King will call single garment of destiny or in African philosophy, we'll call Ubuntu, you know, I am because you are, right? But like this notion that like we're, we're, we're connected in some kind of way, then leads to like, okay, how are we gonna to cooperate together, right? Like how are we gonna be intentional about the future that we are co-creating, right? So it, put, it puts power in our hands to create the communities we want, the economies we want, and the type of relationships that we need, right? If we're gonna thrive, you know? And so to me, it's a whole, uh, it's a shift right that that is actually natural but we've been taught as unnatural but i think that the notion of we're independence is is the social construct right it's the thing that we've made up one of the great things about cooperatives is it's about building the individual both physically and mentally and also building the community as a whole so especially within the mondragon system you're not coming just to work within a cooperative. You're coming to build, you're coming to learn new skills. You're coming to build on those skills, right? So it's this asset-based approach where um, we meet you where you are. We learn what skills you, you have to offer and how do we use those skills within this model for your growth? How do we develop other skills Right, so you're you're learning, and you may use these skills within the grocery store, or you may go build your own cooperative that is maybe, like you said, um, Amaha, those other co-ops that are um, coming out of, of that process is because of those skills that we are building um, from the initial process of that participation, that welcoming participation, that inclusivity. Uh, folks, yes, please come here for the social hub. Come here for, you know, to access your food. But it's beyond, It's not just about food. And that is something that makes the difference between, you know, going to your grocery store or going to something that is driven from the community, is built from the community, and whose mission is to continue to empower the community and influence self-determination and self-sovereignty. Hey, you so know, I, it, can I add oh, something? Yeah, 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 go ahead. So I do want to add though. So like one of the things that's exciting about this is that it's a sort of economic development bottle that is not reliant on subsidies or sort of government, government subsidies or government prop-ups. However, as a person who sort of leads policy advocacy, I do want to note there is also significant need to build off of that into larger policy advocacy and political power around the policies because we can have all this great success and it is highly possible for the systems to intervene and sort of crush it. And so I would point to, I think a good example that probably most people on this call would be familiar with is you know, there used to be all these black black high streets that were these wonderful, you know, upstanding business districts that were parts of the black community. And our Department of Transportation built highways through them and destroyed them and like, and between that and redlining really crushed a lot of the social infrastructure that existed in the black community. And like, we need to have sort of like political power and like broader alliances to sort of be prepared for and tackle the sort of bigger systems that are incentivizing things the way they are out of our government. Yeah, I would agree. You know, and it's, it's interesting that like, like uh, what, I, what I've witnessed in Dayton is, is how co-ops actually emerge power in the community. And I'm, I'm calling power the, you know, the ability to transform lived environments, right? And, and it's by participation, right? Because to me, part of the thing is like, how do we transform residents from uh, recipients 
into co-strategists, right? That instead of just we're at the winds of whatever is taking place, they're like, no, we're actually determining, we're self-determining the future. We're building our strategy together. Like we call it collective hope, right? Like how are we leveraging our gifts, talents, and resources towards, you know, the vision that we're co-creating together. Like, like, like Mona was talking about this self-determination, right? So like, like, like in Mona's example, the, I don't know if it was Kroger or whatever, but like some supermarket closed, right? So like with, with like, that leads us at the whim, you know what I mean? Like, oh, they want to pull up shop because of this, that, and the other. And then all of a sudden we're left to pick up the pieces, right? But like, like, like with co-ops, it's like, 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 no, like we're, we're determining that like, like, this is something that's important for our community. So if you want to keep this in the hands of our community, now we have to shop there, we have to occupy it and take ownership of it, you know, but it's like, 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 like we have the keys in our hands to determine our future and our, our community capacity. Like, I, I, like, I like to talk about community confidence, right? So she's talking about asset-based community development, right? So like, how do we acknowledge the gifts, talents, and resources in our community? You know what I mean? Instead of trying to outshine each other, how do we acknowledge the dignity? How do we acknowledge the gifts? How do we know that like, like, like the more that we, we bring our gifts to the table, the more we all shine, right? And so it's like, like, like it's, it's a shift in the mind state, but it takes building trust, right? It takes building these deep relationals instead of being transactional, deep listening in the community, right? But it's knowing that like we had the keys within ourselves, right? To, to determine uh, our future and what we're passing down to future generations. Thank you. So everyone has uh, spoken on, you know, access and um, independency and whatnot. So how can Black farmers grow their clientele and how do people find out about fresh markets and people who have, you know, the resources on their own without these um, larger organizations or infrastructures? You want to hop on one? Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I, get, I think that goes back to building the collective, right? If you have farmers who are, are working the fields, we know that farmers are working the fields and there are other folks who are involved in their own roles as far as how we're providing farmers to, to basically um, succeed. And part of our role, and especially like for myself, if I know there's black farmers out there, my role is to not only ensure that those black farmers are thriving from what they're producing, but to then pass along that information. Hey, did you know that our food here that we are, are selling is coming from a black farmer? You want to learn more about the black farmer. Do you want to learn how to farm? So it's, it's that collective effort and intentionality of introducing Black farmers to um, consumers and introducing consumers because a lot of consumers should know where their food is coming from, right? A lot of times we don't know. Um, being intentional with that, I think that's how they, farmers build their, their clientele. That creates uh, some self-sustainability. So do we see that being um, a realistic um, thing that we can achieve in, you know, this modern society where most people are consumers? Can I talk a little bit about that? There, there kind of needs to be a, a multi-pronged series of things that need to happen kind of simultaneously. So yes, Black farmers need to reach more customers. Black farmers also need more land. And um, I'm just gonna like, most farmers probably think they need more land, but particularly small farmers and farmers who are growing, small and mid-sized farmers who are really aiming to grow what I, what I would call real food that is food that people are gonna eat, not grains that are gonna go into fuel or animal feed. Um, like who I know also consider themselves real farmers. like. But like, there, there is a huge inequity in land ownership around agricultural production. And so we do need to be working on like, what are the safety, the farm safety nets and the economic systems that incentivize agricultural production to look like what it does right now, which is same as the grocery stores. We have a bunch of systems that are set up to be bigger, 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 more intense, more intense, more efficient, more efficient, and not having the sort of diversity and resilience and 
um, just sort of complexity that would allow for more people of, and different kinds of people to thrive in our food producing, in the food production side of the food world. I, I also have like a very immediate thing that people could do to help black farmers. <laughs> um, if it's okay for me to sort of bring it up here, you, you all probably don't know what I'm getting at. Um, there is currently from the USDA a cooperative agreement being offered that each state gets to apply for one and one state agency has to choose and be the applicant. And it is a funding mechanism specifically that the USDA is putting out to try to invest in historically marginalized farmers and to build their access to the sort of traditional big ag, big food system supply chain. And so it's not aimed at the sort of this small community directed cooperative kind of economy that we've been talking about, but it is aimed at how do we get the farmers who have been locked out of the sort of main food channels for generations, how do we find the farmers that still exist and give them what they need to get into those channels? And so I'm actually working with a whole host of partners right now on what do we, how do we shape what Ohio's application for that cooperative agreement is gonna look like? Because we have a number of partners who have really developed specializations in working with the small farmers who have not had access to all the resources and giving them the skills and tools like food safety certifications and just like marketing channels to get into these supply chains. And then they have the markets. So if we can get them into the supply chains and then help them, there is a pathway to long-term sustainability that these farmers can grow and expand and build into that market that they have historically been locked out of. And so if people want to get involved, there's two ways you can sort of take action right now. One would be, if you know black farmers who want to be selling, please let me or Mona know about them and help me connect with them. And the second would be call your elected officials and nag them and say, this is such an amazing program. I hope it's actually gonna help the historically marginalized and black farmers that have been locked out of our food system so that they know to be keeping an eye on it and helping us sort of watch, sort of advocate for this program to be to be done really well in the state. Right, and, and I, I think part of the key to that, thank you for sharing that, Michaela, is, is the, uh is like each state, like uh, people inside the state don't have to, don't have to fight for the, the funding. You know what I mean? So I, I think that's like a, a, a huge a huge part to it. And if I could add a couple, a couple other points as far as for black farmers, uh, I think one is the National Black Food Justice Alliance. I'm not sure if people are familiar with that, but like it is kind of becoming like a clearinghouse for, for black farmers, for the whole black food systems uh, development, right? So, like, I would I would look into them. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, how we can support our local economy. So, I think part of it is because of our hist uh, black history, and, and like we've had an incredible land losses, like 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 Michaela was 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 talking about recently. But uh, but but sometimes uh, we as black folk have kind of gotten away from food because we associate it with. Uh, like lesser labor or like not understanding like how we can build economies out of that right and so it's like, like no like, like this is part of our history and our tradition that we need to keep and we need to pass down to future generations right and so like how we can show how you can actually make money out of farming right like it could be a legitimate career um and the third is how to focus local so like in dayton we have like, like, like we're hyper segregated. We have 98% of African-Americans that live in Dayton, live on the West side. So we have a West side local designation inside of our store. So that like, if you see that little sticker, you know that that dollar is a black dollar going back to the black community, right? So like, like there, there's ways that we can tag these things so that we can be intentional about like how we're supporting and developing uh, the, uh, our, our black food systems and our, and, and you know, like Mona said, connecting people together. Thank you. So I have a question for really everyone, but especially Mona. So what do you see for the future of Cincinnati and food access and sustainability? So for um, one, again, I think we 
you know, the pandemic highlighted a, a lot of the breakdowns. So how do we, we move forward? And with that, we have to be equity centered. And I think in going back to the black farmers in that historical context of systemic racism, that the historical context of social and economic inequities that have happened, we have to do something bold in order for us to move forward. So right now there is a lot going on in, in I mean, articles have been coming out recently about how black farmers are getting eviction notices. They're significantly in debt. And although there has been some um, $4 billion in American Rescue Act funding that was supposed to be provided, there's been pushback against that. So again, the racism is con continuing to happen and we have to find that point where we say, you know what? Damage has been done. We need to do something bold and brave in order to move us forward and to be sustainable. So we need to address that. We also need to have fair policies. And these fair policies have to honor the land. So we need to think about our environment. We need to honor labor and protect our workers pay them fair wages so they can participate in our economy. And we have to um, honor our cultures. So often our, our cultures within these systems have been denied that we have to bring that forward. So in order for us to be sustainable, we have to have all of these parts in, into consideration, being equity-centered, being community-centered, um, you know, we originated out of operating in, in collectives. Then we shifted, started going towards more individualism. This pandemic has shifted us back into um, thinking more in a collective manner. And we're finding that it, it's working. We're, we're thinking more local, more regional, right? And so we have the opportunity to make these shifts, um, but it's gonna take all of us including through policies in order to to ha for, to make this happen. Thank you. And Michaela, from a policy standpoint, you know, you have this background in ag agriculture and uh, recreation and all these things. So how do those play into what you see for the long term and what needs to happen long term? Um, so, you know, I do think, I think we do need to be thinking about how to build collective discourse and dialogue and having conversations about, you know, these, these truths that, you know, they're facts. And then we need to figure out ways to have conversations about, okay, so now what, what do we do about it? Um, and I want to sort of go to one of the things Mona was talking about around um, the sort of collective action and the interconnectedness. It, it sort of reminds me that I think back about how, um, when you do, if you've done the sort of groundwater training or these sort of racial equity trainings, how they talk about like, you know, racism and like race is this cultural construct is like one of the original divide and conquer strategies um, or, or it was a divide and conquer strategy. And we still have that, right? Like there's still this divide and conquer strategy. And one of the divide and conquer strategies that I see is the sort of neighborhood against neighborhood of like, yes, we do like, yeah, we need that, but I need to deal with my neighborhood's needs first. And starting to get to the point where we're having conversations about the universalism of a lot of these issues and the structural systemic, like these are outcomes of structural systemic things and to overcome them, we need to be working across neighborhoods and not sort of being like, well, just my neighborhood first. And so like one of the things, the people on this call, right? Gem City kind of came out of organizing in Northside around a co-op grocery. Gem City, it happened for Gem City. It didn't for co-op for Cincinnati or Northside because of a lot of structural systemic issues. 
now it's coming back around. Mona's going to make it happen. But meanwhile, Mona is also collaborating with a grocery store over in Lower Price Hill that is a community rooted grocery store. Mona is supporting organizing across a number of different neighborhoods that have a need for grocery stores. And so we're sort of like one of the things I'm seeing come out of the pandemic is moving past that succumbing to the divide and conquer strategy and moving into a sort of like, hey, we are all in this together and like we can help each other solve our problems. And so like that, to me, that's one of the things that's exciting and offers promise is um, the sort of larger, larger collective work and awareness that's happening. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you so much for everyone and your outstanding remarks. So uh, right now we are going to shift a bit um, to a culinary experience that is historical and cultural with Andre Taylor. And Andre is a graduate of North Carolina A&T with a bachelor's in history and North Carolina State with a master's in public history. Andre has focused his research on foodways from the African diaspora and how recipes have been saved or shared throughout uh, families to preserve their cultural heritage. He also focuses on the food used in recipes from the African-American community. He is a native of Philadelphia and Andre has conducted research in South Carolina examining how climate change and sea, rise, sea level rise impacts Carolina, excuse me, and sea level rise impacts coastal communities of color who struggle to retain land and cultural heritage. So let us welcome Andre Taylor. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for having me. Um, as it's been said, my name is Andre Taylor and I especially, especially like talking about food as an educator. Uh, most of us love talking about food as a way that we uh, fuel our bodies, but I don't think we're talking enough about how we fuel our minds. Uh, specifically, what I'm looking into is uh, I'm going back to my research down in the low country of South Carolina. And first thing comes to mind are the Gullah Geechee people. Uh, as we see the Gullah Geechee people, um, we think of them as people who are descendants of enslaved people, which is true, but I don't think we give them enough credit. And I think another thing when we talk about food and African-American food ways, one of the biggest uh, problems I have uh, with people who talk about it is the first thing you hear is we got the scraps and we turn those scraps into, into food. And the answer is no, uh, we didn't do that. So one of the things uh, that I enjoy now more than I have in the past, uh, something that's called okra gumbo. Okra gumbo is uh, a, it's a delicious dish that I like, but the history that's involved with it is what I really like. So of course, when you think of okra gumbo, the first thing that comes to mind is okra. Okra uh, has its roots in Africa. It's first uh, known, the first known example of, of, uh, of the first known example we have of uh, okra showing up is gonna be in Ethiopia. And that reach from that region there it began to expand and goes to the Mediterranean, but its arrival in the United States is very particular uh, to a story. So when you cut okra in half, there's lots of seeds inside. Why is this important? Because as enslaved women were captured and taken to boats and brought to the Americas, these seeds ended up with them. They had the know-how to say, I need to have nourishment. I need to have something to feed myself. I need to say, I will survive no matter where I am. So the, the history of okra to me is very interesting because with most foods, you see the spread coming from the transatlantic slave trade itself. Rice is another thing that's very uh, prevalent when you talk about gumbo. And when I talk about that, Carolina gold rice. So what you have here is a seed of rice that comes all the way from Madagascar by way of an English explorer, uh, brings it here, doesn't know how to cultivate it. So instead of sailing around the tip of Africa and going to Asia, why not just go ahead and utilize the land that we have in the low country? So you have people that were taken from Benin, Togo, uh, Sierra Leone, Ghana, and brought over to South Carolina specifically to cultivate this rice. So from one grain of rice in Madagascar that was brought over by 
uh, one English person who just capitalism was all throughout his system. Now you have plantations galore in a low country. And with that, um, you have these people who are, who are cultivating this rice. And again, remember, we're not supposed to have the knowledge to do so. So they're damming water, uh, they're running irrigation from lakes and streams, and they're not using uh, modern technology. What they're using is wood and the know-how of digging ditches and moving water and controlling and harnessing the power of the earth. And with that, you would think of anybody who can control that much of the water has to have some know-how of how to eat seafood. So going back to this, so this is nothing more than a typical shell uh, from a shrimp. To most people, it's discarded, thrown away. To our people, it's seasoning. What happens is you go ahead and take all the shells off of the, off of the, off of the shrimp, and you boil it and you make your stock. So the base of the stock is going to be, the, that's going to be very interesting going forward with, with this, uh, this recipe. So your stock is there, you use the shrimp shells, and then you take the shrimp, you cut it, you clean it, and you boil that as well. But you're using the fats uh, from, the, from the nature that you're gonna find, uh, be it animal fats or whatever the case is that they would use. And things like parsley, which is something I think all of us have in the house. At least I keep a good, good amount of parsley around. And you have usage of herbs to season foods. So again, we're going to debunk this myth that Africans, enslaved Africans uh, did not have the know-how of preparing certain meals. And we're going to debunk this whole concept that, excuse me, uh, that we were given the scraps. We weren't given the scraps. We just knew how to harness everything. So this rice, again, is cultivated. And I have some of it here that I'll share. And it's, it feels different. feels very different in hand. It's this Carolina gold rice. Cooks differently, thickens up. It's, a, it's more hearty uh, than other strains of rice. Um, but what they did is they took this rice and what was ever, whatever portion that they were able to get, get to feed themselves, they would use the items around to prepare meals. One of the meals that we're talking about again, going back to this, this okra gumbo, is this. So what you have here is everything that they had their hands on. You have okra, you have tomatoes, you have parsley, and you have shrimp. Most importantly, you have rice to push this through. So no longer can we discuss African history and not talk about food waste. Food waste tell a bigger story than we could ever think. We all know about soul food Sundays, but beyond that, the farm. The farm is where our history really begins to get going. So for myself, um, Growing up in Philadelphia, you don't really have much access uh, to the land uh, to farm things. It's, it's a concrete jungle. However, my grandfather always kept a garden in the backyard. That would be okra, uh, there would be tomatoes, uh, there'd be other types of uh, uh, herbs and spices that he would grow in his backyard. Perfect, awesome. So fast forward now, I have twin girls and they're six years old. The biggest thing for me is to keep them in the kitchen with me so that they're learning the history of food, not just how to prepare the food. The two are synonymous because once we're talking about food, what we're doing is we're sharing our oral histories. As an oral historian at the College of William and Mary, and I'm gonna use this concept and my PhD work beginning this, this, uh, this fall, where we're gonna examine the oral histories that exist at African-American food ways. One of the things now that we're doing here in my home is operating raised beds in the backyard. This way, um, the, the, the portion of history that I think are negated when it comes to African-American experience are taught. My girls are learning how to till soil. They're learning how to plant uh, based on season. And they're gonna learn how to harvest, can, and prepare from that. But the most important part of it all is when you have this, these elements are the histories that are involved. Just the same way that I broke down the rice uh, and the aspects of how we harness the rice and how we brought the rice here and were able to cultivate it and made it a cash crop here in this country, we have that same know-how today, but we're not really examining it. I think the worst thing that we can do is forget that we are used to working in the dirt. We are used to cultivating. We are used to taking everything and using it all at once. So to say that you can take something from the sea 
something from the land and bring them together to create a cultural experience is amazing. And I think that when we go to restaurants now, we owe it to ourselves to understand that this is a way of life for some people in the kitchen, but it's a way of history for those of us who understand the ingredients and the way that things traveled around the world. Um, what's interesting now is there are some people who are buying into this concept of educating our young uh, to keep them active in the fields and have them understanding how to cultivate things, not only as a way to sustain themselves, but to educate them. Uh, St. Coastal Farms in Durham, North Carolina uh, is operated by Kamal Bell, and he works with a lot of inner city youth uh, to teach them these exact elements. They're cultivating foods that initially were uh, brought with us from Africa here, or things that were already being cultivated over there. So they're getting a history lesson through farm work. And I think that that's very important as we go forward. Um, that's very important as we go forward with talking about our food history. So Gullah Geechee, the Gullah Geechee community uh, gave us a language. They gave us recipes. They gave us an idea for how to move forward. And I think that that's something that we are missing out on by not partaking in historical and cult cultural events that happen in different places. We go and we travel and we wanna look at things uh, that are fun to do, but we're missing out on the elements that are there. The lived experience continues today. Uh, there are several people in the low country who consistently are farming, preparing foods and educating through their food ways. So don't ever just consider that we're just eating to feed ourselves. You should eat to not only feed yourself, but also to, to feed your spirit and your brains. Uh, Foodways offer this to us. They're here. We just need to utilize them more. Uh, this discussion uh, prior to, to my conversation tonight uh, was very much so needed to be heard uh, because I think we do need to know that we have to return back to our roots when it comes to uh, understanding how foodways impact our lives directly, not just physically, but again, mentally. And I'm most proud of the fact that we have talked about these items. So hopefully everyone can take uh, this knowledge with them tonight, um, move it forward, because it's critically important that we preserve our cultural heritage through our foodways. And we can't just uh, use the excuses of, there's no supermarket nearby. We can't do this, we can't do that. Um, too many people have suffered for us to have the ability to be educated enough to bring our roots back to life today. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Andre, for what you shared with us. I want to definitely want to ask you a few questions, and I also want to allow a little time to bring the panel back after a, a little bit of while in case there are any um, questions or, or, or final remarks. I know that we've had a conversation about um, the land, the soil, and in and, and a relationship that we have with the soil, and I think We've been urbanized, many of us, including myself, have been urbanized to the point where we lost that relationship with the soil. Can you speak uh, a little bit more in depth about that, um, of having the significance of our relationship with the soil um, as it relates to food? Yeah, um, I, I was very much so guilty of that. You know, I, I, as I said, I grew up in a concrete jungle. And what it was is, it was easy for me to go to a grocery store. It was easy for me to uh, go buy something from McDonald's or something like that. But what I did notice is the older people in my family, my community weren't going to those places. You know, there were always lots where they were, you know, dilapidated places, but they cleared the, uh, cleared the debris and, and started farms. And because of that, I, you know, I was always pondering what's going on, what's going on. But once I started my research in graduate school is when I really found out that I myself was ruining my cultural heritage. If I'm not passing this on, as our older generations uh, travel on to, to the other side, we're missing out on, on these opportunities to educate our children. So for me, it was very important to have, make sure that my kids were with me every time I went on a trip. You know, And it wasn't just that we went to Hilton Head or anything, we never went there. We always stayed in or close to St. Helena Island, South Carolina. And that was purposely done so that my kids could see uh, the lived experience. You know, we got a chance to see people who were able to cultivate rice, you know, people who were cultivating okra, people who were growing onions and spices 
And it was a community event where they would bring whatever they had and going back to bartering and they would bring it to a central location. And the only thing that came from was this magnificent meal. So now we're seeing this work and I, you know, my kids said, well, can we do it? Yes, we can. And so that was, I was nudged at the time by three-year-olds who wanted to know what it was like to put their hands in the dirt, not just to play, but to cultivate. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And, and one of the things I definitely want to share is a part of this history. And um, I believe uh, we had previous discussion, I believe it's called Fog. Oh, you're talking about Frogmore Stew. Frogmore Stew, yes. Can you enlighten everyone about Frogmore, about the stew, stew. And, and, and what we call it now and yes. the historical significance? So the Frogmore Stew uh, comes out of the Frogmore Plantation in South Carolina. And it's something that most of us have had when we've gone to restaurants in the low country or uh, Georgia or anywhere that has a seafood menu. And you'll see corn, you'll see sausage, you'll see shrimp and potatoes. And most people call it a low country boil when indeed it's Frogmore Stew. And you, it's easier to call it low country boil because you can't say, hey, you wanna try some plantation food. I mean, I don't think that would go over well with anybody. So by changing the name of it, what you do is you open up the doors for marketing something to attract more people to your community. And when you do that, you're pretty much whitewashing the history and the cultural heritage that, that existed. So Frogmore, the Frogmore Plantation has since long gone, has been long gone for some time, but the people are still there and the Frogmore community still exists in South Carolina. So when you drive in, you still see people cultivating rice. You still see people going to the shrimp boats, you know, and you're seeing what, what, what people did hundreds of years ago to feed themselves, not to make a mockery or anything, but now it's being taken advantage of and utilized as a way to market the South in a more light way while dismissing the, uh, the dark history. Dismissing the dark history does nothing more than leave a lot of people uneducated. Uneducated people make stupid mistakes and become politicians. Understood, understood. Um, and so, um, you know, is there in your work, um, what is your overall purpose um, for our communities that you look at that you want to, well, I guess, what is a lasting message uh, that you want to send as our, as our as you look at you know uh, the history and the legacy of our foodways. The biggest thing I can tell people to do is press record. Uh, too many of our older groups, uh, our our more senior uh, members of our community, are passing on, and with them, they're taking history. Uh, they're taking ways of cultivation. They're taking ways of storytelling. Uh, and my work, uh, what I'm doing now, uh, and it's, it's a project that's called Black Folk and Their Food, Addressing Traumatic Memory Through Foodways in African-American Communities. And what I want to do is interview as many African-Americans as I can uh, to bring them, bring their stories to life, but also to capture these recipes that otherwise will go vacant and, and at the table because they're going to take them with them. Uh, my grandfather himself, when he died, he took the biscuit recipe um, and we'll never be able to replicate that again because he never let anyone in the kitchen when it happened. My overall goal now is to make sure that I have a repository that's in place to continue teaching the, uh, the lessons of our community. Um, even though people are gonna go on, we still need their stories to exist. And I wanna have the repository that's going to lend itself to that, that, that mission. Well, I definitely want to thank you for your efforts. You made me hungry uh, with that uh, wonderful uh, uh, okra gumbo that you had uh, prepared. Um, and so definitely, and at this time, um, we have about another uh, uh, approximately about five to seven more minutes left. I would like to bring the rest of the panel back on, if you don't mind, and please stay on as well. Um, Dre, as, as everyone that is still here uh, to come back on. Um, I was looking to see if there was any um, questions in the chat. I will ask everyone, there's a lot of information that has been shared on the chat, uh, whether there were links uh, to information 
uh, we covered a lot, um, uh, you know, in our conversation, um, having an understanding what food justice is, having an understanding what food apartheid is uh, as well. Um, and I just want to give um, the panel as well uh, any uh, a call to action or, um, or that has not been said or something you wanna double down on um, at this standpoint that you would like, um, you know, the public to be more aware of, uh, to take action. And um, uh, Maha, I can start with you, um, uh, if, if you don't mind, sir. Yeah, I, I think uh, one thing I wanna mention is, uh, I, I love what Mona is, is doing up in, in Cincinnati. You know, she's, a, she's truly, a uh, a, a rock star, and and by by starting with uh, a buyers club, like it's it's real smart. And I wish we actually we had we, I wish we were smart enough to do it. So so it's like I, I appreciate you know what she's doing. And I I think um, going to what Michael was saying, I think it really is key that that you know a, a system that's based upon independence is rooted in fear. Right. And I, I, I think like when we're talking about cooperation, we're talking about rooting uh, our communities inside of love. Right. And and how that can be how we have more power together than we are individually, if it's neighborhoods, if you know, what I mean, like it, it expands out, you know, and so like like, like the Gentry market, we have five thousand is like five thousand four hundred members some, somewhere around there. Right. And so it's like, like, how do we leverage that platform then to address other issues in the community? Right. So like there's multiple ways that that co-ops can be used to further community vision and, and further uh, our shared identity and our shared um, purpose, right? And, and so food is 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 one of the key ways to do that. So I invite people to do, to be engaged and involved, right? And and to let your voice be heard on like like what is the community that you want to shape, right? And like how you can use your gifts and talents towards uh, doing that. I think you're on mute. I, I, yeah, I thank you once again. Thank you for your contributions. Thank you for your thought leadership and the activism that you're doing up there in Dayton. Definitely have to take a trip up there to visit uh, uh, the store. Absolutely. Uh, Michaela, uh, any last uh, closing remarks you would like to share? No, I, I think I already managed to slip in my call to action. Um, but I would say that Amaha and some others shared some really good books in the um, chat, which I, I haven't actually gotten to read any of them yet, but I've read the reviews of them and like people should go read these books. There's a lot of great scholarship out there that people could be learning more. Absolutely. I believe one of the books um, I mentioned, um, Dr. Jessica, uh, Dr. Jessica Harris. Um, actually, who we had on a discussion uh, last year for Black History Month, along with the um, Senator John Heights um, Museum, uh, with the leadership of Samuel Black, who has also joined the webinar, I believe uh, he's been sharing some information as well. And uh, Sam does an outstanding work there in Pittsburgh, uh, as well as uh, his scholarship in food way. So I definitely want to give a plug and shout out to him and joining us here today. And um, Queen's Mother's Kitchen uh, has been a, a wonderful partner uh, uh, in this endeavor. I will say that we will continue to do some work, but I definitely want to give Mona, give you the opportunity uh, to share some closing remarks. Sure. I think um, taking some of the suggestions in the chat, as far as those book books and creating community and collectively reading them and discussing and reflecting on where you are right now. Where is your community and where would you like it to go? Don't ever underestimate your own skills in making things happen. Um, I never consider myself an activist. I am an engaged community member. That is all. I saw a problem and I said, you know what? I don't like this and I'm gonna do something about it. And started talking to the other folks and said, how are you feeling about this? And when they you know, shared the same similar thoughts, it was a snowballing effect. And that's all it really takes. And so if you're seeing um, injustice, whether it be in food, 
whether it be in something else that's happening within your community, don't be scared to start asking questions, to start conversations and uh, collectively moving forward on through love and um, yeah, making it happen. Well, thank you. Thank you once again. I want to thank all of you. I want to thank uh, uh, Andre Taylor all the way from North Carolina um, as well for sharing this uh, experience with us. I will say in my final remarks that the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center uh, understand that food justice is an essential part of the social justice movement. Um, uh, we embrace the idea that the Underground Railroad was one of the initial uh, essential social justice movements in this country that changed policy uh, to help change behaviors. And we have to continue to lean on the legacy of our forebears and continue to do the work. And so we wanna encourage all of you to make a positive difference in your respective communities. Understand that uh, the forebears and our ancestors are counting on us. The generations to come are counting on us. So it is our responsibility and our obligations for us to know better and to do better. And so with that being said, keep in mind, I'm looking forward to working with everyone that's on this panel here with the organization. We actually have a freedom, uh, a freedom food initiative that we are working on. And so I'm to be re-engaged uh, with everyone on this panel uh, in regards to that initiative uh, so that we can start to close the gap uh, as it relates to food and our health. Uh, once again, I want to thank all of you for joining us here today. Um, this will be, this has been recorded. It will be uh, warehoused on our video library. Uh, and someone asked about the notes. We will also try to make sure those notes are available as well. Um, but for more information about the work we are doing here at the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center, please visit freedomcenter.org. If you are not a member, get your membership today and, and help us continue to bring about these meaningful conversations here today. Thank all of you for joining us. Have a good night.